physics. He's a um, he's been he's a musician. He's a coach. He's been a teacher for a number of years, and he's now pursuing a um, degree here under uh, Jimmy De La Torre, along with Greg Camilli, and he's um and so today's talk is. I think something that actually will reflect his uh, broad set of interests and uh, perspectives that he brings to, unique perspectives that he brings to problems. And so he's going to bring, talk to us about data and education and life. So, you guys. Oh, and by the way, as usual, this is taped. So, you know, you're on tape. <laughs> um, so, I was hoping for the PowerPoint technological uh, extraordinaire that it is as a software package where you can sort of read your points over here while actually looking at your slides, but unfortunately that doesn't exist currently. It's a configuration. So I will be reading you know, all of the, the notes that I put here because I will have to stay in doing something like this where I think I talk to the entire building, I am trying to be a generalist. And that means that I'm going to talk about things that I am not necessarily a full expert in and probably far from full expert in. Um, a lot of people, because I've taken a qualitative methods class, I learned what the idea of a post-positivist is. And many people, I think, interpret me this way, uh, especially my colleague Kevin Krauss. And when uh, I, I speak about these things, I don't want to come from that perspective. And I think that I'm actually going to present a lot of information here that is going to totally fly in the face of um, the idea of what I've come here to learn to as measurement. Um, I'm very passionate about ethics as well as the educational mission. And all I'm hoping to do is in presenting the array of things that I've researched for this presentation is to sort of um, provide food for thought, not necessarily discuss the values behind it or the actual ways to, uh, to interpret it. I don't want to be that much of an interpreter. Um, and I feel that the push for practical action, which always seems to be embedded in educational research, uh, needs to be taken with a grain of salt because it seems to push things that sometimes can lead us down. Uh, an alley where we end up at a dead end and we wonder how did we get here? We just spent so much money. Um, and is this going to get better? So um, I assume that the right click means forward on this wonderful thing. Uh, so yes, yeah, solvency and long term planning are a big deal. And I'm going to try and mention money occasionally. So four weeks ago, we saw a talk that may have, you know, been had a lot of sort of non-secular overtones. And not that I want to you know, jump to that sort of level, but I want to use what is typically a non-secular term to add a little bit of um, fire. I want to secularize it, but I also want to maintain a little bit of the non-secular ideas behind the word sin. All right, now it's been misinterpreted. Um, over 2,000 years of time, it's used in a very forceful way. Uh, to prevent people from quote unquote screwing up or messing up in a, in a way that will damn them. But I think the way that it was originally written in the actual form uh, that it was written in, it simply meant to miss. You know, sometimes you do things and you miss. You have a good intention, or maybe you have a bad intention and you purposely miss. Um, so, in the language that I'm trying to use to talk about data here, I want to talk about misuse, um, meaning like to actually, you know, have good intentions and miss. Um, versus categorical misuse, categorical, deliberate misuse of data to push you down sort of path to lead you towards an analysis or a measurement that the conclusion is already being drawn for you. Um, and I think that da data has the capability of being used in that way far too often. And we see it, you know, whether it's through marketing materials or whether it's through public policy sometimes. Data is being pushed at us in a way that you know makes us sort of um, already jump to a conclusion when it's not supposed to be the conclusion that I think people want us to have. Um, so I want to just say that secularizing loaded language um, that really, in its intention, I don't think it was ever meant to be loaded that way. Uh, it can be extremely you know insightful for for humanist reasons, um, but 
you know, the non-secular loading of it is what gives it sort of the, the potential for the misuse, for the real categorical evil. Uh, in Zen and the Art of Archery, I think the reason that sin became such a loaded term is because it's very difficult to talk about really hitting when you really do hit the mark, when things really go right and you're doing things just right. Um, and so when he says here that, you know, you have described the master, says in Zen and the Art of Archery, you've described only too well where the difficulty lies. The right shot at the right moment does not come because you do not let go of yourself. So, like, in getting to that, to the right moment to let go, you know, in shooting the arrow at the board, you have to sort of let go of yourself and just let the arrow hit the target. You know, forcing something too hard leads you to miss a lot of times. Um, you brace yourself for failure, and I think we all do this a lot. So long as th that it is so, uh, you have no choice but to call forth something yourself that ought to happen independently of you. I think we think of this with the educational mission, um, that you know we're doing something that ought to be done, that should be done, that, that will help you know a large number of people. But so long as you call it forth, your um, so long as you call it forth, your hand will not open in the right way, like the hand of a child should open up, like with, with pure ease. And um, you know, I think that when we try and push forward the policy that we know will help everybody, it's almost like it gives, everybody knows that it's a good thing for everyone involved. Um, and we seem to all be caught in some weird dichotomy now, where we just fight each other and don't actually get to the change that's helpful. So. In physics, we have something you know which is called the collapse of the wave function in, in quantum mechanics, and that leads to the probabilistic uh, unknowing of where a unknowableness of where an electron is or where a microscopic particle is, um, and that's the pure, unadulterated, random raw data of the universe. You know, we see things happen, and then we finally decide to measure it. And I think when we measure things, we sort of take a leap of faith when we go from the dark blue box to the light light blue box. That what we're measuring is going to retain the information that really was in the raw data. Um, there's different ways to look at it. When we measure things, sometimes we're aiming for a confirmation to either prove or disprove a model. And in the exploratory frame, you know, we're hoping that the data speaks to us for what it is. So it enters at both sides of it, when you measure and when you analyze. Uh, and, and as good researchers and academics, we always like to think that we can subtract ourselves from it, but again, as I learned in the qualitative methods class, your lens is characteristic of your analysis. It's a big deal. And I just want to say that that lens even lends itself to, you know, people who think they're pure statisticians. When they use a model, there are inherent assumptions in the model. And that turns out to be the lens there as well. Um, the Hawthorne effect is another example of this, uh, as been discussed, the placebo effect in medicine. Um, and you know, raw data, in my opinion, overall, should also be made a lot more available. I think in academia, we have the uh, we hoard, you know, what our data is, and we don't necessarily allow other eyes to peer at it as often as we should if we truly want to be as rigorous as we say we are. Um, so preventing misuse is a big deal. Uh, it's something that you know can lead to academic failures. We also noticed. Um, we had Seitzma, uh, Klaus Seitzma from Amsterdam here a year ago, and he is uh, a member of an institution where there was a social scientist who was, you know, using fudge data and actually, you know, gave a whole bunch of other students the chance to analyze it. They got PhDs. Those PhDs are now being, you know, taken away because the data never actually existed. It was, it was created out of thin air. Um, this is a big deal. So I kind of want to also, you know, put forth the idea that we should maybe retain a little bit of that non-secular loading when talking about misuse of data. Um, because it's deeply consequential when policy is sometimes enacted because of it. I think that the language of misuse versus a, you know, sort of I screwed up, but I, I had good intentions idea um, is, a, is a really good framework for thinking about how maybe sometimes assumptions that we make about our own data can lead to, um, you know, misuse as the as the bad sort of way. I wanted to have a red pen and a yellow pen so I could sort of hold up my hand with the yellow one when I'm talking about mis use versus red for misuse. So uh, unfortunately, yeah, there's no yellow or everything that I wanted to do today is kind of flying in my face for, for this presentation. 
Um, academics have the greatest role, in my opinion, to play about being angry about misuse. Oh, God's That's pink, pink on the it's pink on the slideshow. There you go. So yellow when I'm talking about misuse, meaning warning. Red when I'm talking about evil misuse or you know somehow sinful misuse in a way that I want to you know sort of keep that that idea. So academics, in my opinion, have the greatest role to play in demanding that policymakers do not misuse data. And when it becomes apparent that data has been misused. Correction should be made immediately. Otherwise, the consequences can be, become rather severe. And so, since I'm also from a science background, my first two examples uh, are going to be more sciencey in nature. Um, so there's something called peak oil. I don't know if anybody's interested in economics or following the fact that you know the barrel uh, price has gone down to forty dollars, you know, forty-five, fifty, approximately right now. Um, but there's a man named Marion Hubbard who worked for the Shell Engine, and in 1956 he promoted this theory that, you know, given his experience with wells and how Shell was, you know, draining oil, that, you know, him postulating a long-term curve or fitting his statistical model to it, uh, we would see something where peak oil would have happened around 1973, and then it would all diminish past that point. Um, this is from his original 1956 paper. And nowadays, people still use this methodology, and they're still postulating ways for, uh, you know, ways of looking at where peak oil might be and when we actually might hit it. Um, so these three models are four models here that are fitted to this curve. <coughs> There's something missing from all of them. The Hubbard curve is innately an idea that is geological. It pretty much assumes that we're talking about the oil that's in the ground and draining that oil that's in the ground. And that's sort of the input. But what's missing from this model completely is if oil was $1,000 a barrel, we would find every tiny little fragment of oil that might be sitting underneath the Pacific Ocean or you know, in the deepest parts of the entire world to drain as much of it as humanly possible. Because that it, it has an economic piece to it. It's so economics plays a huge role, and it's a missing variable from all of this. And I guarantee that if it stays at forty forty dollars a barrel or drops to twenty, we're going to see something like the yellow or the orange curve here. Um, but if we see it jump to a thousand dollars a barrel, um, we're going to see something greater than even this blue curve. So another. Very clear example of misuse, and I don't know what side of the political spectrum you sit on, but that's partly why this is clear misuse of data, um, is because a topic about the fact that you know ice caps are melting and sea levels could be rising um, and climate change is happening is is something that has a lot of uh, scientific validity. Uh, there's the world is our raw data, and a lot of people have been looking at this for going on now 35 years. And so there's still ways that data is being misused to try and push a political agenda, which again, I feel that academics uh, should be crying out much louder. At. Uh, so for example, there's a very correct statement here, and that is that Antarctic sea ice uh, is at its greatest extent in decades. And this is the plot of it. It's a upward trend of a regression. And this is surface area. But ice is not necessarily measured in surface area, um, even though when I look at it, yes, that might be a much larger Antarctica than I remember seeing 10 years ago. Frankly, um, the idea is that there's volume involved. And when you look at a picture like this, and you see an iceberg that has come off of Antarctica, and then people are telling you, oh, but look at all that ice all around the outside. You know, that shouldn't be that should be freezing over. Well, frankly, a cube of about that size inside that, <laughs> that large iceberg, um, can basically fill in all the surface area that you're seeing of ice right here. Which means that, you know, in order to push an agenda, I can certainly use surface area statistics. But in terms of actual volume, and if you've watched any episodes about this lately on Vice, um, 
they've kind of gone through the scientific work with quite a few reputable scientists, and they've shown that, sorry guys, in 100 years, we're going to see probably three feet of sea level rise. We're going to see a meter. Um, and it's an unstoppable process now, and it's not going to be slowed down. So, you know, how long do you want to keep arguing and not prep? It's fine. Yeah, it, you can say that this is an opinion, because obviously I can't see 100 years from now. But the evidence is out there, and 98, 99% of scientists agree on it. Academics are trying to make a statement. Media doesn't necessarily want them to. Now when we flip over to policy side, and obviously, you know, that's policy as well. That can motivate policy. Um, but we're not seeing that happen yet. Economic data, we have a wonderful, you know, um, screaming about how great Obama has been for the economy. And, you know, I'm not, this is not a, a policy discussion. I'm not trying to be political again. And yes, the unemployment rate has dropped considerably since he's been in office. What we're not looking at are the U3 and U6 numbers in unemployment. Uh, if you want to look up exactly what those are, it has to do with exactly, you know, how many people are doing different types of work or have dropped out of the workforce, et cetera. Um, and when you actually add up the number of people who are long-term unemployed and just have considered not looking and are no longer part of the statistics, we're still up over 20% in terms of actual unemployment. You know, again, that's not how the labor, the Bureau of Labor Statistics want to put it, but that's what's happening. And you say, yes, but we are getting jobs, aren't we? I see those job reports all the time. But well, the job reports are hiding the fact that everybody who's, you know, not everybody, but most of the people who are getting jobs are part-time workers and they're bartenders and waitresses. And if you think a sustainable economy with retirement plans is going to fall out of that, well, you know, that's, that's your prerogative and you can go with that. But um, that's how statistics, again, can be sort of manipulated and we don't discuss what's actually in the details. Uh, and then policy decisions get to sort of be a, a foregone conclusion made for you. Um, and this is just another quick, uh, somehow somewhat more sinister sometimes, where the measurement itself already leads to a conclusion. In the Charlie Hebdo um, march in, in Paris, which is one of the largest marches in, in modern Parisian history, uh, it was being you know sold throughout the media that it was led by a coalition of world leaders. And this was the picture that they show. I mean, that looks like a heck of a crowd that they're leading. This is the raw data. This is a blocked off street for a photo op. And, you know, if you haven't seen this photo before, I mean, you know, take it in a little bit and let it sit with you for a second and, and just wonder, was there, was there something, you know, that they're trying to sell? Um, so let me get to the slides that I'm on so that I know I'm keeping up with my actual presentation. So one of the reasons that I actually quit teaching is because I wanted to learn how data could more um, appropriately be used. And I had to learn it from a social science perspective because I was a physicist. Um, and we had a very well-defined models. And if the bias is off, we subtract it. That's how it's done in physics. We know the answers. We know how kinematics works. When an electron hits a proton and I get the angles wrong in my detectors, I just subtract it because I know what the angles are supposed to be. I know exactly where these things are supposed to go. If I see something slightly off from the other and it's not in a perfect plane, I simply subtract off that angle on the right-hand side and I make sure that they are in a perfect plane. That is, it's math and it works really well and I know it to the one part in a billion. You know, and, and if it's off by more than that, I know that maybe that's the noise in the detector. But if it's three parts in a billion, that is categorically biased. You know, and that's how we look at data. It's not obviously how things are done in social science. So in Edison in 2011 and 2012, they have pushed um, Singapore math as this new uh, you know, way to teach math to first through eighth graders. And it, you know, it has a great deal to do with getting better test scores. Um, tests by NJASC, which are made by Measurement Incorporated, which also has a partnership with Harcourt Mifflin Harcourt. Harcourt Mifflin, sorry, <coughs> Harcourt. So in a way, you know, maybe the measurement and the analysis are also being tweaked, but I don't want to say that. I don't know. It's impossible to tell though. Um, but essentially, they say they it hopes to improve students' overall skill in math. I don't know what that sentence means. 
And I think a lot of math education people would also say, I'd really like to know exactly what that set of is too. Um, so there was a pretest, post-test design. No indication that there were different or parallel tests being used. Um, and tests were only administered to the treatment math and focus group. So give a pretest to a bunch of people you're about to teach a special kind of math to. Give them a post-test now that you've taught them that special kind of math. And you watch 5% of uh, the students become 70% um, who scored higher you know, than what they did on the, that pretest. So I'll just read this quickly. When testing was complete, uh, the Education Research, Interna uh, Research International I think, Association, I think that's ERIA, <coughs> discovered that 76% of second grade students scored 70% or higher on the post-test as compared to only 17% in the pretest. Could have been a really hard pretest or a pretest that was exactly the type of Singapore math that was being taught. Uh, who knows? They didn't let us see it. Uh, additionally, 39% of fourth grade students got 70% or higher on the post-test, whereas on the pretest, only 5% scored at that level. The ERIA found that student demographics, including gender, ethnic background, or socioeconomic status, did not have any significant impact on scores. And I highly doubt that as well. Anybody who's done some research in educational statistics? I don't know. That, that's a sketchy thing to say. Furthermore, it was determined that students scoring either low or high on pretests showed both large gains during post-testing departments. So despite all the flaws uh, that could be inherent in this, our superintendent um, has a public statement that success in a 21st century global economy demands that students possess a deep understanding of math concepts. And the dramatic results of this study prove that math in focus works to do just that. Um, Edison is proud of its partnership with HMH and the ability to implement and study this effective Singapore math program in New Jersey. Now, Edison is a heck of a district for you know a, a good corporation to, to jump in and get some money out of its $240 million budget, plus one of the largest teacher unions in New Jersey, being the fifth largest township in, uh, in New Jersey. That's This is a big deal to sort of land this deal. And, you know, the fact that HMH has something to do with NJ Ask, and the fact that they're pushing this, and that they ran their own study, and there was no control group at all. I mean, this is what another reason that I said, you know, by the by the end of this year, I got to get out of here, and I got to figure out what, how people do data so that I can say this is wrong, not be a teacher complaining under my breath that I don't think this is very scientific. Um, so this sort of is, you know, my whole discussion about how data can be misused. <laughs> Um, or, you know, just misused. It, like, this could be the case or this could be the case. I'm not necessarily sure. Um, so there's bigger research questions with much more consequential results. I think that ideas of measurement, ideas of equity, um, teacher evaluation, value-added models, and the instructional reform that sort of falls out of those. Curriculum reform is a very loaded topic. I, I don't even know where to go. And global competitiveness uh, in terms of international assessment and that it actually means something for policy. When I read these things, I already inherently think about the assumptions that this research leads to very practical action. I don't. It's born in me. I'm in, I'm in this school. It's sort of what I've learned from the people who taught me here. Um, and you know, maybe I'm just reflecting that sort of idea that they have, but. It's, it's sort of a big deal that actionable, uh, that actionable plans result from this research. And I think we're all bred to, to feel that, and that there's a necessity for it. But some of the consequences that I'm just going to quickly go over you know, have to do with, well, Campbell's Law in measurement. Well, I'll say that for you specifically when I get to the slide. Um, equity has to do with fairness and money. Um, we all wonder about fairness and whether you know, by subsidizing one group, we end up, you know, messing with another group. People are, have argued about this for a long time. Uh, the amount of money that also goes towards equity might not necessarily have great consequences either for the whole population at large. Um, there's high stakes decisions that are already being made based on teacher evaluation uh, and value added models and how they inform each other. Curriculum reform, I think, has long term consequences that we have yet to see. I don't know if we're ever going to see them because we won't be alive to really see how they, they evolve. But um, you know, sort of whitewashing the content and the, the brain power of our students is, is potential from curriculum reform by, by watering things down. 
Uh, global competitiveness leads to a lot of generalizability questions. Can I say that a student in Shanghai, if I were to, let's say, take a student from Alabama at three years old and place them in Shanghai, will have the best math test scores in the world? Is that what would happen? And I think that that's another thing that, you know, the OECD is almost pushing us towards having that conclusion, but it's not necessarily true. So before I get into these things, I just want to, you know, take a quote from Stephen Rottenbush, who in the most recent educational researcher uh, has a, an article about value-added models. And I thought that this paragraph was very poignant. Does the answer to a precisely focused research question by itself have implications for practical action? What happens when other things are not held constant? For example, if we give school district leaders the authority to base personnel decisions on value added or other measures of teacher effectiveness, will we undermine the authority of the school principal? And if we do, will that be good or bad for students? Will we encourage or discourage teacher collaboration in solving problems of instruction? As Johnson, another author in, the, uh, in that, that issue, discusses, um, as he reasons, and how will that affect student learning? Applying James Coleman's ideas, um, Johnson asks whether we will augment or undermine our capacity to mobilize the social capital of the school to strengthen the human capital of the teacher. And again, when I left school, what I recognized by sort of new administrators that had walked in is that the social capital of my town um, the social capital of the institution of my school was being degraded by people who wanted to walk in and make very clear-cut decisions and sort of push people out uh, that had given invested a lot of their energy into the school district. Um, and when that sort of happens, I, I feel that it sort of brings down the overall um, demeanor of the teachers that are there. I think that that then leads itself to the contagion, the mood contagion that then infects the classroom which then sort of, you know, leads to a general disrespect of the institution of school and where it goes. So we have to, you know, really, really, really be careful when we do this research. So measurement, first topic on there. As Plato quotes Socrates, because even though we say Socrates said it, it's definitely Plato who said that Socrates said it. Uh, education is the kindling of a flame and not the filling of a vessel. Well, flying in the face of that, measurement is purely aimed at the vessel. I, I don't see a kindling of the flame being measured well. There are a few assessments. I'll actually um, try and point if anyone's interested in the kindling of the flame. There's an assessment called the Colorado Learning Attitudes uh, Survey, which has been done in physics education, which actually seems to be very well researched and, and validated and doing a heck of a job. Uh, doing some research here at the physics department, I was able to show it using a structural equation model that about 20% of the variation in student grades at the course were actually due to an attitude latent structure, a latent variable that I found, um, which, is e which is equivalent to the 20% of variation that was actually being explained by a conceptual survey purely on physics concepts or force concepts. So the fact that attitude and prior knowledge of force concepts we're both contributing the same amount of variation to final test scores to me already leads me to think, well, why are we neglecting emotional intelligence, social intelligence, uh, sort of motivational factors in terms of measuring students and trying to get them more motivated or to kindle that flame? And this, this cartoon is great because the woman who, uh, you know, th there's a new hire, he comes in, I'm patching it, I want to teach, and she goes, well, you know, I prefer the term that I'm actually a quantitative learning gains facilitator. And it's, it's really funny because that's sort of how teachers are more being treated nowadays. That you're supposed to make quantitative gains. Value-added models are totally going to tell me that. So I've talked to some people who I go to school with here. And um, when we talk about, you know, what the future of education might be considering the current trends, we wonder if there's just eventually going to be, you know, one globally recognized master teacher who will be video streamed into the classroom. Uh, a low-paid behavioral supervisor will sort of act as a classroom manager in the, this larger-than-normal class of about 40 to 60. And, you know, they'll be much better stratified because we'll definitely know where they are at three years old. 
by the time they get to eight or nine, I mean, it'll be obvious where what classroom that they want. That's scary. That's a very scary potential reality um, that I think we need to think about. But more so, what really scares me about the idea of measurement is that as a belief system, it is extremely harmful. Um, Campbell's Law says, and you know, quoting, the more any quantitative social indicator is used for social decision making, the more subject it will be to corruption pressures, and the more apt it will be to distort and corrupt the social processes. It is intended to monitor. I, I don't think, when I read that in Dr. Jatomer's class, I kind of felt that this guy's my hero. I, this is one of the most succinctly stated, you know, phrases or, or definitions that allows me to think he knew what he was talking about. Um, and I think it's totally coming to, to bear. This was in the 1960s, he said it, just like Marshall McLuhan was talking about the internet in the 1960s. These people were 50 years ahead of their time. Um, now, Mark Twain also says, facts are stubborn, but statistics are more pliable. Another wonderful quote. It's absolutely true. If Every time you hear of a marketing quote, I, something about 20% less or 40% more or how are they measuring these percents? Uh, if you've been studying statistics, you wonder what percentage are they talking about? Which type of property of, the, of this product has been changed by that much? Um, but what, I, what scares me about, again, the measurement paradigm in social sciences is that um, are people just as pliable if statistics are now pliable? And carrying that to the furthest extent, uh, Edward Bernays' theory of engineering consent is, is a deep, um, deeply scary sort of concept that has been used multiple times, you know, to, to influence policy. And if you don't know who Edward Bernays is, and you've never heard about, you know, the, the sort of things that he did to even, you know, push uh, propaganda to, to help influence the United States of joining World War One, it's a very, very big deal. Um, the type of things that, that he discusses in terms of social science, being able to engineer uh, human consent. We fix the measurement. Your analysis is practically done for you. Now, racial equity is another um, fearful, you know, like topic. It's loaded. A lot of people discuss racial equity and are we closing the achievement gap? And there's been a lot of statistics out there that prove that we have, that we're closing it considerably. Um, but then, you know, you find that the College Board is still reporting scores by wealth, and we like to say, oh, SES is a huge factor, or the SATs are now unbiased because, you know, we measure diff. And in 2008, they're reporting that even in households that more than $200,000 is, is the, the family income, we're still seeing a 149-point gap in SAT composite scores. Uh, and that's, that's a scary statistic, because it still means that SES doesn't explain everything that we'd like it to. Um, there was another one that I forget. There was uh, another one that I had behind it that also showed racial disparities. I don't know why it did come up. Maybe my animation is off. Um, moving on to boys and girls, we say that you know gender equity is another another issue that we push on deeply. Um, boys are much more likely to be retained in K through eight than girls are. That it's it's definitely a fact. I don't know how motivated we are to go save the boys, right? But then you look at SAT math scores, and in terms of the, the ratio of, of scoring above a 700, men are completely dominating the game. So should we save the girls? You know, like statistics can be used to push either sort of opinion. And I mean, these are clearly these are clearly weighed on one side or the other in terms of an equity argument. Pushing to an even more delicate equity topic. Um, well, actually, I wanted to talk about what Kay Heimowitz says in this um, this interview, but unfortunately, you know, I, I don't want to stream and stream. There's a feedback problem with sound, but I'll just try and mention a few of her points uh, before getting to the next slide. She's a fellow uh, from the Manhattan Institute, and she talks about, you know, women are now better educated. They're becoming the majority breadwinner. Um, they've even won more gold medals, you know, in the last Olympics <laughs> than the men did. Um, so they're essentially alphas, and, and they're acting like alphas, and they're dominating, you know, the workplace. I'm pretty sure that about six years ago there was a study, and the median income of women in New York City was higher than men. 
and, and that just shows that you know they're doing a lot to get themselves ahead. Uh, but by the mid thirties, they back off the career ladder a little bit. And what do you think happens near the mid thirties? Right, family sort of takes over. You start taking more time off. Um, the idea, though, is that we pine for equality. Like in education, as far as the educational mission is concerned, we are aiming for almost absolute parity. And sometimes you wonder, is that goal even attainable? And Kay Heinowitz, in this in this interview, what she says is that I think it's a, a terrible disservice to talk about absolute parity actually being attainable and being and pushing for it. She's not to say that discrimination doesn't exist but that we might be setting goals that will actually hold us back rather than push us further. And I think that there's, it's about a 10 minute interview. I only wanted to show the first four minutes of it because I'd rather have that come out of my mouth. Uh, I'm sorry, her mouth rather than my own mouth. Um, and it, it's also something for us to think about. Are, are we aiming for absolute parity? There are some people that work, I know, at 36 years old, being in graduate school for a whole second time, that my 401k will never look like the 22-year-old who got pushed into a management position by 25. It's just not going to happen. And I can scream about it and pound on the table and be angry and upset about it, but uh, you know, I will never have that person's wealth. I never will. I made decisions, and, and it's life. I just got to deal with it. Definitely upset about it. <laughs> yeah. Got to deal with it. Um, now, equity and fairness in terms of special education is a whole nother topic that seriously needs to be talked about from a fiscal perspective. Because starting with 10% being served you know, right after the Supreme Court passed uh, IDEA, we're up to now 14% you know, of students being served by it. And when you talk about the educational expenditures, um, in 1987, yes, the, the state was you know, giving 56%, federal was giving 8%. But now the state's down to 45%, and costs have only ballooned. And this is in 2000, it was 45%. So I imagine it's even lower now. Um, in the year 2000, the, the statistics on the amount of money being spent on the, on the lowest, I think, half, or I should say the highest in need of support, half a percent of special education students, it was on the order of $100,000 a year. And there were 330,000 students who were being served with that much of a subsidy. That's $33 billion to, the, to this half a percent. And at 2012, the cost of putting the entire nation through college, through a public education college, um, who, was, who was attending public education at the time, is $62.6 billion. And again, I'm not, there's no value judgments here. I'm just talking pure statistics. Even when you think about towards the future, how much of the money being earned by which population will actually return to tax money, which will then in turn fund the system, and which, which model is sustainable and which one's not. Sustainability is a big deal. We're talking about it in terms of the ecology of the world uh, and in terms of energy consumption. Well, we should really be talking about it in the state of, uh, you know, or in the United States where we have $18.2 trillion of debt and the state itself of New Jersey is in $78.4 billion of debt. And now local governments are definitely doing the rest of the work in terms of subsidizing this, this amount of money that has to spend. So it's, very, it, it's a scary prospect looking forward. And we know that we're going to be insolvent. We know it. We know there's going to be another crash. We know we can't keep it up. I, I mean, are we talking about this? Or are we just plodding along with our research? Um, now, Dan Goldhaber, in terms of... Uh, High stakes value-added models and value-added models and teacher evaluation. Moving on to this topic, uh, in the most, you know, same, in the same, um, the same issue that Rodney Bush spoke. I wanted to read this to you. He says there is disagreement as to whether value-added is a valid measure of individual teacher performance. Value-added estimates also vary from year to year and at the secondary level across class sections leading some to suggest that it is not reliable enough to be used for high stakes purposes. And I, I know they're suggesting it. That's the fault of academics. What they should be saying is that they're not to be used. But again, we're academics, so it's a suggestion. Um, perhaps of more fundamental import, estimates of teacher effectiveness are somewhat sensitive to the model used to translate student achievement into teacher effectiveness. Again, models have a lens. 
measurement leads to analysis, and that measurement and analysis are usually very much intertwined. Um, and more sensitive to the student test employed. So if they're even sensitive to the test we use, if we want to use NJASK instead of PARC, you know, we'd have whole different results. Um, the implication of this is that one's view about the use of value added is likely to be influenced by the outcomes viewed to be most important. For example, student test scores or teaching practices. And moving into, you know, another quote by Linda Darling Hammond in this issue, she says, I do what I do every year. I teach the way, or she's quoting another teacher who says, I do what I do every year. I teach the way I teach every year. My first year got me pats on the back. My second year got me kicked in the backside. And for year three, my scores were off the charts. I got a huge bonus. What did I do differently? I have no clue, right? So fiscal decisions are being made on this as well. Um, I want to say, like, not only sort of is this paradigm um, of measurement, like, entering the classroom now in New Jersey, New York, Chicago, Houston, like, they're doing this anyway, whether we like it or not, right? So it's leading to high stakes decisions that, thanks to the fiscal squeeze that we're all feeling, because we're all under large amounts of debt that we'll never, you know, ever swim out of. Um, and the consequences, you know, of that sort of the greed that led to that debt that continues to pile on. Uh, in Edison, the superintendent is he's an ardent believer in data. He believes in it so deeply, despite his flaws, he'll gladly fire than rehire, especially since the average cut of a ten year teacher will save them essentially thirty to forty thousand dollars in next year's budget. Like automatically, if I want to make sure I trim, man, you get rid of tenured teachers, uh, you hire new ones, you, you bring them in right at the bottom of the ladder, and you save twenty five thousand dollars with a simple, you know, administrative decision. That's a number. That's great. I, I win. Um, this makes teachers fearful, right? I mean, it makes them competitive. It diminishes again the spirit of the workforce. This changes the tone of the classroom. It diminishes the students the school and the institution as a whole. And if no one's happy working for a boss like this, I mean, how are students going to be happy in that classroom where they feel the social sort of influence of the teacher? Mood is contagious. It's been proven that mood is contagious. And we're supposed to be educating these people culturally, not just, you know, quantitatively. Um, and what I'd really like to do is now let's flip the, the script. Let's put the lens on higher education in college. Um, the Economist reports, if America were getting its money's worth from higher education, that would be fine. On the research side, it probably is. In 2014, 19 of the 20 universities in the world that produced the most highly cited research papers were American. But on the educational side, the picture is less clear. American graduates score poorly in international numeracy and literacy rankings and are slipping. In a recent study of academic achievement, 45% of American students made no gains in their first two years of university. Meanwhile, tuition fees have nearly doubled. In real terms, in 20 years, student debt at nearly $1.2 trillion has now surpassed credit card debt and car loans. I mean, this is us, again, funding something that may not be paying us back. Um, I took a class called, uh, I forgot, it was in higher education. Dick McCormick teaches it for the CSA program here. And in this class, it was only half a semester, and my, pro my project at the end was to sort of research how administrative costs are, are ballooning and that, you know, what students are getting for it. Well, they're being treated more like consumers. We're building new buildings. They're gorgeous, and you know we're selling it to them. So, I wanted to have the argument of is a private or is a is a bachelor's degree a public good or a private good? And I was going to let the group themselves split themselves in half. And I was amazed, and this might be again the training of the CSA staff or the CSA you know students here, but they all fell on the side that it's a private good. All of them, every single person in the class. Um, now, in my Harvard, like I'm, I'm applying for this Harvard uh, fellowship, and they force you to do a statistical project where you kind of try and um, prove that, uh, you know, you, you evaluate a dual enrollment system and say, is this leading towards greater college enrollment? And, and this is for state policy, because we want to push the dual enrollment out to as many people as possible and sort of motivate it and amp it up. 
And uh, you are going to be our analyst, and you have to prove that it actually has done good for the people who are involved in dual enrollment. Well, if this is now going to become state policy, that the educational mission is essentially being spun into prepping students to purchase a product or a private good, well, I mean, I think education is in a very serious identity crisis. If that really is going to be the case. If college enrollment is going to be treated as a private good amongst people who are training to be administrators, because CSA is sort of pushing them in that direction, right? If you're going to be training to do that and treat it as a private good, and that's the way, that's the philosophy, then how are high schools taking it on that college enrollment, you know, is actually my product. Like, I, as a public good, as a public trainer, public educator, have to push this sort of paradigm. Something's happening in the middle, and we're not all on the same page. And I, I think that's a really big deal. And it's just my opinion again. Yes. Um, the curriculum reform is now a, a very serious thing. And um, I'm only going to talk from the STEM side, because this is my experience. And I you know, did the physics undergraduate. I did a physics PhD. When I took a physics undergraduate and got out, I realized that a physics undergraduate or four-year STEM degree was about as useful, my physics degree, was about as useful as a philosophy degree, getting a job. This is 100% serious. Um, so Bayer did a workforce shortage survey two years ago, and everyone on the you know private side is saying, we want more H-1B visas. We want more H-1B visas. Why? Because they say they can't find STEM-trained people. So um, four-year percent, so there's, I'll just read the top one, only half of these Fortune 1000 technical recruiters say they can find adequate numbers of qualified job candidates with either two-year or four-year STEM degrees in a timely manner. TRs, uh, technical recruiters in the manufacturing industry in particular say it's difficult finding adequate numbers of four-year STEM degree holders. And essentially when it comes down to it, they can't find people who have the necessary STEM job skills. That's the big deal. That's the, the key statement here. Because in higher ed, we really like to sort of sit back and say, we have to teach people generalized topics. We have to generalize what they know. And when I went on to uh, you know, the internet, and Physics Today is like the magazine of APS, which is the American Physical Society, which is the physics research you know, sort of um, overhead umbrella. And I looked up entry level four year degree physics jobs. These are the four that popped up. The first one is called LabVIEW Developer. LabVIEW is a very specific type of programming language. Uh, it's not even a language. It's kind of like a graphical program design. You use it to do measurement. I never touched LabVIEW or even knew what it was by the time I was done with my four-year degree. I have used it, but I used it post-PhD in a startup where they had to do this you know, at some point. So I knew a little LabVIEW. Definitely not enough to be a developer. You even know a developer, like as a comp sci grad, you've got to be an expert. Um, senior analyst in marketing analytics. How the hell does a four-year uh, you know, physics person know about marketing analytics? We don't do statistics. We do you know, propagation of errors. That's the most statistics we do. Physics instructor position. That might be the only legitimate thing that a four-year STEM degree person can do out of these four jobs that popped up. And this is it. There's only four that popped up on the Physics Today magazine. Um, applications engineer for, for vision systems. You don't do computer vision. Maybe if you're an astronomer, you do do a little bit of, of computer vision you know, modeling. Out of 450 chemist jobs, eight were entry-level chemist positions when I looked up just chemistry. That's a STEM degree, four-year STEM degree. So what we expect people to have in terms of skills with a four-year STEM degree is not what recruiters want. It's not what jobs are actually being offered. And so when we say, hey, we need to go to another country and bring them in, the only solution. So you know, these things, it needs to be informed by job requirements, maybe, not by educators. I hate to say this. It, like Coming from, again, that STEM world, maybe you need to think a little bit more about the skills that you teach in higher ed, or that people teach in the physics education world, or the math education world. Uh, math educated, if you don't come out with a four-year uh, math degree and you're not doing something in MATLAB, modeling something, like specifically with computer language, it's very hard to say that you are a mathematician who's competent to walk into Boeing and do something for your time. It's very sad. Uh, H-1B visas have cumulatively, cumulatively now removed more than three million jobs in, in the U.S. Um, 
And again, th and this is sort of touching on my research. In terms of global competitiveness, when we think about Shanghai, when we think about um, you know PISA scores, TIM scores, we immediately jump to the conclusion that these are one-dimensional tests. And the people at the very top are at the top. And that's where they exist. But it might not be one-dimensional. This is from uh, Andreas Schleicher when he presented this last year at AERA. And he says, you know, the country where students go to class matters more than what social class students come from. And how do I know this? Because I have computed the deciles of all social classes in every country according to the piece of results. And I can tell you that the lowest decile, even in Shanghai, is still better than the ninth decile in the United States. And this is his, you know, unidimensional way of looking at the data. What we're trying to do, um, me and Dr. Camilli, Dr. Camilli's idea is that these things are not dimensional, they're multidimensional. And if you think about separating them into multiple latent factors, and then you order those latent factors according to countries, you find some very interesting sort of geopolitical uh, correlations here. I'm not going to tease that out. I'm not a political scientist. I'm not, you know, I don't do the qualitative research from the national, international education policy world. But I will say that, you know, in factor one, seeing all of these groups very regionally located next to one another, in factor two, seeing the Czech Republic, Sweden, Germany, Slovak, Slovenia, and Australia all clustered like in one sort of group, um, all on one side. Like these are ordinal and these are at the end of the spectrum. So these are definitely like a global sort of correlation. That, that tells me that there might be something to the dimensionality of these international tests, which means, again, you cannot pick up a two-year-old, put them into Shanghai, let them live their life, and they're going to be the best mathematician in the world. I, I don't think that that's a possible way of thinking about it, or even moving the whole family. The cultural adjustment, everything that's involved, it, it's a difficult story. I mean, I think factor four, Kazakhstan, Ukraine, Algeria, Russia, Lithuania, <coughs> Armenia, it's just kind of crazy that some of these things load on these latent factors in such a way that you know you reveal these relationships. So, in terms of the mainstream media tendency of we discovered the best, so the world you better emulate them. You know, the potential for misuse of international data is so extreme because in terms of nested models, and this is what we like to call it in statistics, when you're talking about well language, and then country within language, and then region within country and then state within region, and district within state, school within district, and then class within the school. I mean, we're talking about so much potential misuse, which will lead to this type of misuse if we make very clear, large-scale decisions based on the building. And that's the end. I had two questions. I, I found that you were somewhat inconsistent in the talk. So first, you would you would cite the reason the various statistics weren't making an accurate picture, but then you would cite other studies where the statistics give your point of view on question. So you say cultural factors matter. This has been proven. What has it been proven by? Presumably by a measure. Presumably the researcher that wanted to demonstrate this chose a measure where they thought this would work. What gives you the right to say that some things are true and just fine and other things are in dire need of misinterpretation? The second question is, what would be the alternative to that? So you talked about use, misuse, and misuse. What, what do you think would be a model of good use? Presumably you're not saying throw out measures altogether. Um, for your second question, I don't have a model of use. I, I can't present. I don't know if there is one. I don't think that a, I think that maybe Tony Brick presented what I think might be one of the best models that I've seen, which he's currently in development of called improvement science. Uh, and improvement science has to do with taking a whole bunch of measures in the beginning. You have a sample set. You then witness how they sort of go through their, their year. He's doing this at a, at a county college. 
and he's trying to measure their first year success. And then at the end of the year, he looks for the outliers that didn't land with where he predicted them to end up being, given all of the sort of work that he did. And then he does a new measurement the following year, tweaks the model, changes it, and you know sees again what that success is going to be the following year. So it becomes a, a multi-year sort of you know, development. So then what's your model us and how we should interpret this? Well, well, Tony Brick's doing this for education. Well, I mean, there's, there's this quote that's over a century year, century old. Lies, damn lies, and statistics. Yep. So we know the statistics can be dishonest. What should we take away from your talk and how we look at data going forward? Um, without the aim of practical action. So don't use measures for any practical action? No, not never. I say that in, in the sense of looking at data, if your goal already is practical action, your lens has already been chosen for you. And that, that's all I wanted to show in terms of this talk. That if practical action already is your goal in doing the measurement, then you've sort of already sold the baby with the bad one. So you can't have polis? No, no, I didn't. Poly again, research? I'm not, I'm trying to motivate people to be a little bit more introspective about the data that they use for instigating policy. And that when policy starts to go in the wrong direction, and we see that it's going in the wrong direction, for example, you know, using climate change again as this big arching scope of how, oh, well, we still don't know, and the jury's out on it. And no, the fact is, I think we do kind of know. And we've measured many things like this before, and we see where it's going. But in terms of education, is that where you're? I mean, no, I, mean I, I mean, you just said that we know what's going on with climate change, and we should use those methods for practical action. And you're also saying that we shouldn't use measures if we have practical action in mind. Are you saying we shouldn't test the efficacy of our public policy? Now, I think you're trying to lead answer? to too too much of a conclusion. I, I wanted to sort of you know have this in a, a way of saying there is a lot of statistics that point against the things that we're doing, right? And there are some that point for. I, and you have to again. I wasn't being focused on one particular area of research in which I would be able to develop that from the lowest foundation all the way up to do a literature review, get myself to the point at which I want to implement policy. I was trying to throw out a large array of, of you know, information that will allow introspection. Oh, I'll see the side of the research. So, so to follow up a little bit on Keith's thing, you had issues where you have you made some points where data is maybe misled by people who know better, <coughs> right? So that the ice thing might be. But then there may be models, I think a lot of the models you had were essentially incomplete, which is the nature of science. So maybe you don't include all the factors, but there you learn other factors are relevant and that sort of thing. So given a view that science is tented, we do the best we can, particularly in social science, even more so, when we're trying to do things with a lot of uncertainty. Mm -hmm. And we know it's wrong. We know this stuff's incomplete at some level. Are we not to do things if we don't have that certainty? Because otherwise, we'd never do anything. Uh, I don't think I ever suggested not to do anything. Well, I'm thinking of that, the first slides you had on the uh, geology, you know, the uh, oil reserves. Mm -hmm. Now, some of that seemed like it was just an incomplete model. That he was using. Absolutely. And that's what I think what right. so it's theory, it's not, data, it's not so much data you use as theories that just aren't complete. Okay. And theories that are incomplete when lead when leading to practical action have a potential for extreme misuse. Or mistakes. Or mistakes. Right. But we don't have a choice of not having complete of not having a complete theories, do we? Um, yes, I agree with that. All right, Again, so I don't think, I think that I, you guys are putting a lot of words in my mouth in terms of the fact that I'm aiming towards a, an overall conclusion or a model for when you act and when you don't. All I was trying to do was put up the yellow light. Sometimes we overact. And, we're be, and we could be in a lot of, uh, of these instances sort of be putting yourself in. Okay. Yeah. All right. Well, anyway, thank you.